The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, how one organization is powering progressive change at the state level, a guide to what centrist politicians say and what they really mean, plus Bill Press with Eleanor Clift on the impeachment trial and what it reveals about the Senate GOP. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight, and follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Jesse Ulibarri has dedicated his career to building progressive power at the state level. As a former state senator, he knows how challenging that can be and what it will take for state lawmakers to build a broader progressive movement. And we say hello to Jesse Ulibarri, who is a former Colorado state senator, progressive community leader, and executive director of the State Innovation Exchange, also known as SIX. Jesse Ulibarri, thank you very much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thanks for having me. Excited for the conversation. Our pleasure to have you with us. Now, Many of our listeners may not even know what the State Innovation Exchange is, so let's start there. What is the mission of SIX? SIX exists as a resource and strategy center for progressive state lawmakers. Most folks don't know this, but progressive state lawmakers uh, very often have no paid staff, uh, are working maybe with part-time volunteers, and representing millions of Americans. And so at SIX, we make sure that legislators are prepared to lead by, with, and for the people they represent. We provide training, customized research support, and a whole host of other uh, program offerings to make sure that progressive legislators, as they head into the hard work of governing, have the resources, supports, assets, tools that they need to do their job well. SIX has been around for almost six years now, and we support over 3,000 progressive state legislators across the country. Uh, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, and we focus in on our values as progressives, making sure that legislators are fighting for uh, a resilient, healthy, prosperous future that benefits all of us, not the wealthy and well connected. Mm-hmm. Well, tell us about some of the specific kinds of assistance that you offer progressive state lawmakers. State lawmakers are tasked with the the important and difficult job of writing public policy and making sure it's responsive to the needs of the folks in their community, but they're also uh, key in helping to build a broader movement. And so we see our role as making sure that we're breaking the disconnect and uh, the distance and distress that happens in the state policymaking process. Some of the work that we do with state legislators is to provide issue briefings. Uh, And an example of this is making sure that folks know that there are national trends moving throughout the country, how they can respond, and providing customized policy research support uh, to help them in that regard. In last year, we did a Fighting for Families Week of Action where we shared information about the fight for paid family medical leave, expanding earned sick days, and making sure that legislators were fighting for the kinds of things that would support working families. Those webinars would allow legislators to see what was happening in other states and not just learn about the policy issues alone, which is important, but learn about the strategy. How did a state take on this big fight against corporate America? How did they advance the policy? And then what was the outcome? How did that actually improve people's lives? By doing that kind of cross-state connection and learning, we're getting legislators the tools they need to be successful, not just an understanding of policy, which is essential, but moving that to actual ideas around strategy, implementation, coalition building. Um, The other thing we do is trainings that are skills-based. Oftentimes, we'll have folks who are brilliant and visionary leaders who are stepping into this role, and they ran a really hard campaign, but they may not be experienced in some of the, the challenging things of elected life. How do you do case management, for example? Many state legislators are working with folks in their communities who are accessing state services. Uh, Other times, it's how do you actually engage your constituents in a meaningful way and build up the the deeper connection between elected officials and the communities that represent. Hosting a town hall a month might not be enough. 
Uh, we'll provide services like teletown halls where we'll help legislators call into their, their districts and make sure that folks are hearing about what's happening at the state capitol. I think that's one important thing for folks to realize is that very rarely uh, folks know who their state uh, representative or senator is. Um, they can often name their member of Congress or their U.S. senator or who's at the top of a, a ticket for the presidential race, especially in an exciting year like this. But very rarely do they know the folks who may live down the street from them who are representing them at the state capitol. And so we do a lot of work to make sure that legislators are building that deep connection with their with their constituents. And then they're able to actually move big, bold ideas that immediately improve people's lives. Yeah, I'm always amazed that that people don't know the the their state lawmakers and yet they know that you know the, all the lawmakers on a national level and quite frankly i've always made the argument the state lawmakers are the ones you really want to be paying attention to because they're right there as you point out in your own backyard now jesse some have compared your organization to alec which is the american legislative exchange council a conservative group that promotes republican legislation in the states how is your organization similar and different to alec yeah, I, I like to think of us as the anti-ALEC or the ALEC killer, but not the ALEC of the left. And I think it's an important distinction. ALEC is an organization that has been used by the right to destroy our economy and our democracy by consolidating wealth and power uh, from a very limited set of perspectives. They are a pay-to-play model where their corporate interests um, or their social conservative interests can make a play, and then they push out uh, – model policy, copycat legislation in every state, like danger ground laws, um, of which we saw in Florida. Uh, And that is incredibly destructive. It centers power in a small set of hands, and it uh, is incredibly detrimental. And I think that's the thing that we have to focus on. The tactics that they've used, the way they've oriented to state legislative power has been harmful for all of us. And so we are not the alec of the left, and we don't aspire to be because of the kind of harm they've done. But at the same time, we are an entity working in the progressive movement space, specifically with state legislators. So we're operating in the same space. And we're working with legislators on really understanding national trends and policy. But we're not a pay-to-play model. We receive our funding from individual donors, from grassroots partners, um, and from others. And all of that's available public online at stateinnovation.org. And we're, we're not pushing our own agenda. What we're looking to do is for individual state legislators to be working in deep partnership with their local organizing ecosystem, that they're building relationships with their neighbors and their constituents and advancing a people-centered policy agenda. So that kind of orientation is significantly different. We also aren't pushing out model bills. We are helping people understand how folks have tackled really difficult issues and then customizing that support in state. And an example here is last year when we saw the slew of uh, anti-abortion bans moving through the South, we were able to alert folks about the kinds of things that were happening in those states. And it put additional state legislators on notice that they had an obligation in this country, not just to act alone, thinking about what was happening in their state, but that there was a national effort to restrict abortion access. And so by sharing information across state lines, we had legislators from Southern states talking to legislators in Northern states about the importance of codifying protections and making sure that abortion access could remain possible in this country. It's that kind of cross-state connection, deep, deep understanding about the the national ecosystem that is essential for legislators to be successful um, across the board. And so our model functions different. We operate in the same space and we are focused on the long game of building power by, with, and for the people. And as as I mentioned at the at the, at the top of the interview, you yourself have served as a state legislator in Colorado. From your experience, how important is this kind of assistance that six can offer? And did you have that kind of help when you were in office? It's a great question. For me, I was someone who came into the work as a state legislator from organizing. I'd worked on issue campaigns and ballot measure work in my home community. And I had the great pleasure of representing the area where I grew up, including the trailer park where I spent my earliest years of life. And what I found as a candidate running for office, I could reach out and receive assistance and support to learn how to knock on doors and to raise money and to win election. But so much of our attention in the progressive movement is focused on people to win election. And the day after the election, many of those resources disappear. The support for governance, which is very different than being a candidate, Uh, were virtually non-existent when I started. 
Um, but fortunately for me, as I started, six launched. And so my career with six and being a state senator have been intertwined. And I've been able to see the kinds of support that six offers uh, to grow. Uh, I'll give an example here. I finished my election on a Tuesday. I was elected on the Thursday of that same week. I had to step into the Capitol for the first time to be sworn in and to make a vote on leadership elections. Most of the folks who helped me get elected were taking vacation. Uh, my bills that I had to file <laughs> to be considered in the next legislative session were due a week after that. And so the kind of pace that legislators are required to maintain after election, um, I give this analogy. Oftentimes, we, we, we think of the work of getting into elected office as a marathon, and that is true. Folks have to run the race, they have to win the race to be able to move forward. But this is a triathlon, it's not a marathon alone. So if our movement orients to the idea that it's just about running and winning a race, we will have folks who know how to run and win elections. But then we have to get them in the water and they actually have to swim. I know the, the order is wrong for a triathlon, but just come along with me with the analogy. The day after the election, <laughs> folks jump into the water. They have to swim in governance. They have to understand budget processes. They have to understand a very complicated state system. And without support, and if we're only focusing on running the race and not about swimming in governance, we're going to be uh, – you know, where we are today, which is that very few folks are prepared to jump into the, the role of public life without support. And that's where SIX comes in. We focus in on governance. Uh, and we also focus in on the, the next stage, the next part of that triathlon, you know, getting on the bike and riding it means we actually have to have folks prepared for the implementation of their work. It's not just about the passage of policy. It's about protecting those wins, refining those wins, and making sure that those things can be safeguarded for generations to come. And six feels that unique gap. There are 7,383 state legislators in the United States, and we provide support and say, we're here to help you think about policy, to think about governance, to make sure that you can be successful in a position that most folks ignore. Um, and uniquely, those supports uh, have been incredibly successful. This year, we launched the Progressive Governance Academy. So as folks finish their election, they can jump right into trainings with us. We can teach them how to set up their office. We can teach them to do community agenda setting and think about this idea of collaborative governance. Those kinds of resources um, are essential to the success of progressive legislators as they think about building not just their career, but the kind of world that we all deserve. Um, and and SIX is, is right there to do that work. For me, it was really helpful when I launched my career in elected life that I was able to rely on six, uh, that I could connect with other legislators who were grappling with similar issues, who I could call upon and say, how, how does this work in your state? How, how have you thought about this issue? How can I uh, think about this differently for myself? And that's the kind of network we support uh, across the country. Mm -hmm. We're speaking with Jesse Uliberry. He's a former Colorado state senator, progressive community leader and executive director of six, which is the state innovation exchange. Uh, Jesse, once Donald Trump took office, there was an acknowledgement that more progressive work needed to happen at the state level. How has that paid off and where have you seen success? There has been significant attention at the state level and we've seen success. A great example most recently is in Virginia where there's been strong attention paid to the idea that we need to build state power for progressives and then went on the issues that folks care about. Uh, but Virginia is not alone. We've seen uh, gains in nearly every single state since the election of, of Donald Trump of progressives being very loud on the issues they care about, whether it's climate change or abortion access or working on protections for our democracy, states have been leading the way. I think where we've seen the most success is when folks realize that the kinds of things that they may be fighting for or, or believing that should happen through through Congress or the U.S. Senate, um, those those kinds of victories can happen tomorrow in some states <laughs> um, if they're done at the state level. The fight for paid family medical leave, uh, changing uh, the, the minimum wage requirements and, and having wages go up for all working families, extending overtime protections. Those are active conversations happening in state capitals uh, all across this country. And we're also seeing the state legislators take on the mantle for voting rights and making sure that we're rooting out corruption. Um, the big things that most folks believe our federal government should focus in on are being addressed at the, at the state level. And that goes from immigrant rights protections to LGBTQ protections. We saw uh, a dozen states 
pick up uh, LGBTQ protections, including things like gender identity documents. The issues that care that uh, voters care most about, that people care most about, can can turn into reality with sustained support from folks on the ground and moving uh, legislation. But I think it's really important to note that there's a, a, a significant concern here. There's an inverse relationship between federal power and state power. And if progressives only think about winning election in November at the federal office and the focus is in the presidential office and folks in, let's, let's say that there is a, uh, a progressive in the White House come November 2020, there is a natural tendency to say everything is fine. Let's walk away. But Trump and Trumpism alone uh, won't be fixed if we have a progressive in the White House. There's sustained work that has to happen in state capitals and with our neighbors every single day to beat back these ideas of fascism and, and corruption that I think have just been raised to the surface. And the, the most immediate impact and the way we can have those enduring wins is at the state level. Yeah. Now, there's a, another way to understand your work is to look at a single issue. And climate change is one of the issues you focus on. This seems so much bigger than one state. So what can get accomplished at the state level and how does six help? Yeah, this is a great example. In regards to climate change, state legislatures control two thirds of all U.S. Uh, discretionary spending. That's not military assistance. And so that means that States individually have significant financial capacity to make investments um, or to change policy that can do uh, significant work on protecting our climate and protecting our planet. And this is everything from making adjustments in water quality and water protection to um, sustainable agriculture and requirements around soil quality. These are all things that are within the purview of states to do, and they could be doing it immediately. We provide resources and support to individual states as they request assistance on the kinds of policies that could be available. But we've also done a lot of work to help nationalize some ideas and support. So when, for example, President Trump pulled out of the, the Paris Accord, we gave a set of resources back to state legislators about what they could do to try and honor those commitments that we've made as a country um, by moving those into state policy rather than depending on the federal government. That's the kind of power of states working in close coordination and collaboration, thinking about the responsibility, not just to the residents within their districts, but uh, across the country. And that's where six comes in. Mm -hmm. Now, you've also trained thousands of progressive activists, campaign managers and elected officials on how to create change. Obviously, you believe change is possible. But what do you say in this moment to progressive activists who feel, I don't know, maybe their hope is slipping away? Yeah, I've been doing this work for uh, nearly two decades and started out as an organizer. And the first time I went into the state capitol, I went to go testify for our in-state DREAM Act to make sure that undocumented students can be treated as in-state students in Colorado. I testified as a U.S. citizen, shared my concern about the, the folks in my family, the people in my community that I was concerned about. And after my testimony, the Republican chair reported all of the undocumented folks at the committee to ICE. It was one of the most devastating personal moments for me, and I lost significant hope. Um, but it pissed me off enough <laughs> to say that this is not how power should work. And our, our government, our, our public structures should serve everyone in our communities. And so I went back to the Capitol every single year and fought for that bill. And when it didn't pass and when Democrats had power uh, and it still didn't pass, I got pissed off enough to run for office myself. And in my first year in office, I got to chair the full Senate when we passed it into law. And I think that's that's important for me to share in this context to say we might feel in one moment that we've lost hope. Um, but if we lose our momentum, if we lose our focus, uh, we won't see the, the things change uh, that we want. Um, and it does take not just one year or two year or three years. It can take a decade to realize the, the kinds of things that we want for our people, for our communities. Um, and it's that kind of tenacity that we have to have in this moment. We can have, uh, you know, uh, a momentary setback. We can have disappointment, but it's better for us to focus on how we can build every single day. And I'm heartened by the folks that I've trained where I see them struggle one year, two year, and then win big structural reform. Uh, some folks who've been able to take on the biggest corporate interests and win or, you know, implement some big scale programs that immediately improve the lives of the people that they represent. Uh, and that's what we're fighting for, an America that is healthy and prosperous, 
and that we all benefit from. And I know it's possible because I've, I've helped to do it. And so I encourage folks who are listening to the show to go out, meet your state elected officials, know who your state representative and senator is, um, and then put into practice this idea that we can change the world bit by bit, day by day, uh, by being tenacious and ferocious and uh, joyful in our pursuit for justice. Yeah, I mean, change doesn't happen overnight, so you, you just got to stick with it. And uh, I, I think it's wonderful uh, w- what you've done with, with SIX, and uh, we wish you continued success, of course. Jesse Ulaberry, former Colorado State Senator, progressive community leader, and executive director of the State Innovation Exchange, known as SIX, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Jesse, we appreciate your time. We'd love to have you back and talk more about it down the road. We'd love that opportunity. Thank you so much quite welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this americasdemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This social security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, what corporate Democrats really mean when they use terms like purity test. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Government by the rich is called plutocracy. Government by police power is autocracy. Government by thieves is kleptocracy. Government by Trump and gang, however, is all of the above, which adds up to something called cacistocracy. Government by the very worst people in our society. The media have covered the antics of many of the cacistocrats he's appointed, but it's time to shine a light on one of the obscure characters in the Trump cabinet, Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue of Georgia. Hailing from a state renowned for its peanut crop, Sonny turns out to be the biggest goober of all. He's been a non-entity, blithely sitting in his ornate office while farm prices plummeted, bankruptcy spread, and farmer suicide surged. But on October 1st, Sonny suddenly spoke out about the distress of farm families, not to offer assistance, but to slap them right in the face. In America, he smugly lectured, the big get bigger and the small go out. Goobering on, Purdue explained, we don't for any small business have a guaranteed income or guaranteed profitability. What a heap of pious BS. Family farmers are not asking for a guaranteed profit, just a chance at making a profit. Today's ag system has been deliberately rigged by policymakers so bankers and other corporate giants that farm farmers can stiff those who actually produce our food, then grab the profits for themselves. Indeed, the median profit of farmers last year was, get this, minus $1,500. This is Jim Hightower saying there's nothing natural or inevitable about the big getting bigger and the small going out. All it takes are an apt or corrupt do-nothing public officials to turn their backs while agribusiness powers plow under thousands of good family farmers. That is the essence and shame of the Donny and Sonny farm policy. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? 
Well, here's an easy to swallow pill for you the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. Richard J. Escal pays close attention to the words politicians use and the true intent behind them. He says centrist politicians, by design, use language that is often misleading and demands greater precision. And we say hello to Richard Escal, freelance writer and the host of The Zero Hour. It's a weekly radio and TV program. He's also senior advisor for health and economic justice at Social Security Works. Richard Escal, thanks for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Absolutely a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, our pleasure to have you with us. You recently wrote a column uh, posted at Truth Dig titled The Progressive Guide to Corporate Democrats Speak. Now, we're not going to go through the entire guide in this conversation, but I would like to start with the first word on your list, which is centrist. What does a centrist politician want us to think that means and what does it really mean? Okay. Uh, well, great question. Number one, when when people are described in, a lot of times in the mainstream media as centrists, when they characterize themselves as centrists, when political consultants call them centrists, what they generally mean is that they hold positions that are somewhere in the midpoint or mid-range between the Democratic and Republican parties as we understood them 10 years ago. So somebody who maybe thinks we need to cut government spending, somebody who thinks we need to privatize more uh, of what the government does, uh, that sort of thing, um, corporate friendly to a certain extent. Uh, so when insiders, to use that term broadly, use the word centrist, that's what they tend to mean. Somebody who might have been, frankly, a Republican 50 years ago, but is somewhere in the Democrat, the right word side of the Democratic Party. Now, that's how the term gets to be used. But I would argue that, at least when it comes to voters, centrist isn't the right word for that. But that's, that's how it gets used uh, generally in political speak. All right. Now, second word on the list is choice. You call that a distraction, a distraction from what? Well, in general, what happens, I'll tell you a quick story. I used to work in the benefits field, health insurance and other, and one of the most powerful and meanest CEOs, billionaire CEOs in the country was offering his employees all sorts of choice and his own staff of, of this plan, that plan, this savings, that thing. And uh, everybody was confused. But as the outsider, I was in a position to ask, what are you trying to do here with all these choices? And, and he said, and I never forgot it, I want to give them less and make them think it's more. So choice in this context, whether you're talking about health care uh, options, whether you're talking about um, different types of retirement plans, the IRA versus 401k versus Roth plan versus whatever it is, by and large, if it's something that people would be better off receiving as a public good, choice, the word choice is often used to disguise the fact that it, it's not going to be as good a public good going forward, but we're going to give you all these options that are complicated. And that way, if it doesn't work out for you and you find yourself 70 and unable to pay your bills, well, you just didn't choose very well, as opposed to we have an inadequate social safety net. This sounds like uh, don't mind the guy behind the uh, the big curtain <laughs> right out of Wizard of right, Oz, right. right? I mean, are we, are we being hoodwinked no, no, here I, when somebody's uh, using that type of term? Well, either intentionally or not, yes. I mean, my father used to be a pro professional magician, so he knew all about the art of misdirection, which is you get people to look at your hand out here while you're switching the cards with your other hand. So uh, there is an element of misdirection, I think, in the use of the word choice, and there's an element of what has historically been right-wing ideology, which says that the competition is always the way to the best outcome. But if competition, uh, even in classical conservative economic theory, that depends on everybody having all the necessary information. Some things are not subject to improvement through free market competition. And I would argue that 
social insurance is one of those things. So, uh, you know, I, there is an element of, uh, as you say, you know, the man, don't look at the man behind the curtain. And I think there is also in some folks an element of ideology as well. And I also, having operated in political circles a little bit, I think there comes a point in certain people's careers, sometimes early on, where even the distinction gets blurred in their own mind. They're just so used to being with certain types of people, raising money from certain types of people, being advised by certain types of people that sometimes they can't even tell which is this direction and which is just what they come to accept. Mm -hmm. Now, the next word on the list is compete. Now, on the surface, helping American workers seems like a good idea, but what isn't being said here? Well, you know, this is something that, for example, I saw in 2012 in both the Republican and Democratic Party platforms, helping workers compete for the jobs of the future. Now, uh, if you think about it, that is really talking about, we're not talking about workers organizing for their rights when we use language like that. We're not talking about uh, uh, wage growth that is evenly distributed between employers and employees. This happened for 25, 30 years after World War II. We're not talking about any of these. We're not talking about flat wages, the death of the middle class around the country. We're talking about the idea that the way out of the crisis of the working American, which even in this supposedly good job economy, is still a very real thing. We're talking about saying the way out of that crisis is by training what exactly? The million workers who lost their jobs because of NAFTA, they're all going to be app designers and somehow make money on every download. There's a certain, it, 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 it's myth-making. It's, this is, to me, definitely misdirection um, and uh, a failure to understand, among other things, that the loss of any individual job is a loss of not only one person's livelihood, but a family's and a community's. So, uh, you know, there's a sort of, it, 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 it's undergirded with this ideology of individual, you know, sort of Ayn Rand, or you have to compete to survive, as opposed to, well, we should co cooperate to survive, too. And that should be, you know, the primary, that uh, perhaps, instinct we use going forward. So when someone says, well, let's help workers compete for the job of the future, I say, well, how about we help workers organize for the working economy of the future? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess you avoid a lot of, <laughs> a lot of problems that way by, by, by not getting them to, to actually organize, right? I mean, in, in the eyes of some people. If someone says to me, uh, and they've been around for a few years, uh, I want to help workers compete for the job of the future, did you vote for the Employee Free Chili Act when it came up in, in the late 2000s? Did you do other things to help working people organize? Because these were critical turning points in the pathway of American working life, and we should be looking to that in the future, too. Mm -hmm. Now, there's an interesting phrase on the list, purity test. How is that phrase being used by politicians, and what does it really mean? Well, uh, first, what it really means in my devil's dictionary of political centrism is any belief or policy that I, the centrist politician, will not espouse because it would alienate my funders, but I won't openly oppose because everybody wants a 75 percent of voters, let's say, like expanding Social Security, including Republican voters or uh, gov government guaranteed health care in some form, including a majority of Republican voters. So I don't want to say, well, I'm against that. I certainly don't want to say, well, I'm getting money from interests that don't want me to say that. So I said, well, you know, I want, uh, I want that for everybody, too. But I don't think this is a time for purity tests. I don't, what you're really saying, when I, I, if I can convey one message, I want everybody to hear, when they hear the phrase uh, purity test, somebody's ducking an important issue. Because you know what? We all have purity tests. You have them. I have them. Uh, that politician using the phrase has them. They would not, for example, and I would not allow support them if they did. They would not stand against marriage equality. They would not stand against uh, civil rights. They would not stand against, uh, you know, we all have core values. And when you take core values and dismiss them with a, with a contemptuous sounding phrase like purity test, what, 
what you're really saying to me is uh, uh, I am taking a stand that I have neither the political backing nor the moral courage to openly take, so I'm avoiding it. Mm -hmm. We're speaking with Richard Escal, freelance writer, host of The Zero Hour weekly radio and TV program. He's also senior advisor for health and economic justice at Social Security Works. Richard, another phrase on the list is, I'm pragmatic. Please, translate. Well, yeah, I'm pragmatic or I'm a pragmatic progressive. Well, pragmatism, uh, well, there's all history of American philosophy called pragmatism, but pragmatism, as most of us understand it, right, is, I'm pra- you know, I can, I, 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 you look, I would love all this beautiful stuff, that uh, free ponies and all that, um, but I, I want to concentrate um, on uh, things that can actually get accomplished. So I'm going to be pragmatic. Well, the logical next question is, how's that working out for you? Um, Did your policy of so-called pragmatism, did it win you the Senate? Did it allow you to keep the Senate? Did it win you the presidency? Did it uh, result in the passage? You hear it now from a lot of politicians uh, saying, well, I'll work across the aisle with Republicans. Okay, great. Name me 10 examples of how that's worked in the last decade. Just 10, one a year. Give me one a year where that's really worked and created a major success uh, for the progressive ideals you say uh, you espouse. Not a single Republican voted for Dodd Frank. Not a single Republican voted for uh, the Affordable Care Act. Not a single Republican voted for any one of your major initiatives. So that that we would define under this term pragmatic. So uh, leaving ideology and so-called purity tests aside, I don't think you're very pragmatic. So that's my response. <laughs> and I, well, that's a good response to that, indeed. Um... As much as I want to go through this entire list, because I I, I think it's fascinating, we don't quite have the time, but let's step back a moment. There's a theme running through the list that seems to pit real change against the status quo dressed up in appealing words. Is that a reasonable way to understand it? I think it's a very reasonable way to understand it, and I I, I think that's exactly what I was going for. So thanks for uh, the thumbs up. Any way that we can help, absolutely. Um, do you feel that centrists use these words because they work? In other words, they translate to electability. But is that even correct? I mean, do Americans want this kind of kind of slightly altered status quo, or is there an appetite for something more progressive? I think uh, they use these words for a variety of reasons, but I don't think it's because they work, because I think history shows us uh, that they haven't worked. Um, we, uh, you know, whatever you think of the outcome of the 2016 election, it shouldn't have even been close. The 2016 election was, in a sense, a test of this, uh, in general election, was a test of this entire strategy, and it did not work. It, 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 leaving aside other influences, you know, this should have been an eight-point blower. So, uh, no, I don't think it works. I think the loss of the states like Arkansas in 2014 is another example that it doesn't work. I think there are two reasons why it doesn't work. Number one, I think rings of inauthenticity, and I think that voters sense inauthenticity and a kind of like professional class differential with a lot of working people when you start using insidery, uh, you know, language. I think that signals something that turns off voters. But the wishy-washiness, I think, more than anything else turns off voters. So I think that's number one. And uh, I think that number two is uh, it, it, over the years, if you look at polling, uh, including polling in swing states like Michigan with Obama to Trump voters, for example, that these people, these voters are receptive, obviously not the racist ones, but these voters are, some of these voters, including disaffected people who don't vote at all, are re- much more receptive to positions of real change than they are of um, of this kind of wishy-washy. It's because the status quo isn't working for them. And if you poll individual issues, I mentioned expanding Social Security, government insured health care, uh, child and family leave, and so on, uh, you get solid majorities for all these things. So I think that, including things that the donor class doesn't want, higher taxes on billionaires, extremely popular, uh, cracking down on Wall Street, still popular, 
so uh, I think a politics of genuine centrism would be one that meets the voters where they are on these issues and explains what more can be done to help them. And I think that would be a more genuinely successful uh, politics. And we'll see how that works out in the coming year, right? It, absolutely. Um, before we let you go, a few years back, you wrote another column on centrism in which you suggested the possibility of a quote, centrist movement, close quote. You described in there two kinds of centrism, insider centrism and voter centrism. And I think, based on today's conversation, we have a sense of insider centrism. But what does voter centrism mean? Well, I think there are two levels to it. And maybe I should go back to that. But, but, but there are two levels to what I, voter centrism, which is, number one, agreement on a certain set of policy goals and objectives that we should have security in our retirement or if we become disabled or sick that families should be together that that if my child is sick i should be able to stay home and care for her and on and on and on uh, but underlying all of that i think is a voter centrism based on the concept of community and if you look at polling black white young old uh male female uh gender sexual orientation uh, there are certain values of community and caring that undergird not only these individual policies, but make people feel uh, that we should be more of a national community than we are. We should have more of a sense of common purpose than we have. It's one of the reasons I think why people, there's a certain nostalgia for World War II, as horrific as it was, and the greatest generation, despite their tri ordeals and trials, because this was a time of, uh, at least people read think of it, as a time of national purpose. And I think people yearn for that because I think humans are community beings as well as individual beings. And I think voter centrism reflects, would reflect not only these policies, but this sense of belonging and caring for one another. If that doesn't sound too idealistic. Well, I guess to some it may uh, nowadays, but that's exactly what happened with World War II. I mean, the country came together as opposed to what we're seeing now, which is everybody running away from each other. Yeah, and, and the division is a reflection of a lot of things, but uh, including the policies that have abandoned both our inner cities and our rural farming communities, for example, uh, both undertreated medically, both undertreated economically, both uh, lacking in opportunity, both lacking in. So, uh, and it's fascinating sometimes to look at uh, the values that show up in detailed polling in the inner city and those rural communities. Um, so, I think that it is not an impossible dream to explore, uh, you know, a new language of politics that's. Uh, that accompanies these uh, more progressive policies with an understanding of what can and should bring us together, which, by the way, would also mean to me as a writer and former speech writer, getting rid of all the buzzwords about, uh, you know, compete and, uh, you know, let's just talk human to human and uh, change our political uh, lexicon uh, while at the same time showing that there are core values underlying the policies and ideas we're proposing if we want to be America's Democrat. Time to strip away that curtain and show show who the man behind the curtain really is. Yeah, well, and who we are. Absolutely. Richard Escow, freelance writer, host of The Zero Hour, also senior advisor for health and economic justice at Social Security Works, Join us today, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Richard, Appreciate your time with us today. Would love to have you back and talk about some more of this again soon. Anytime, my friend. Thank you very much. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air. And help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. 
And now Bill Press talks with veteran journalist Eleanor Clift about President Trump's impeachment trial and what it means for the future of politics. Eleanor Clift is one of Washington's best-known reporters, authors, and commentators. She's a former White House correspondent and now a columnist for The Daily Beast. She sat down with Bill Press to talk about the impeachment trial, and we joined that conversation midway. The first thing that Chief Justice John Roberts did after he himself was sworn in was to ask all the Republican senators to stand up, raise their right hand, and take an oath to do impartial justice in the Senate trial. Have they violated their oath already? Did some of them violate it before they took the oath? Yeah, except, you know, the Republicans turn that argument back and they say, are any of the Democrats there truly open to changing their mind. And it is a political process. So I don't think you can take the politics out of politics, although it's a nice idea to have the oath. And they all had to sign in, too. I mean, I, yeah. I oh, was yeah, watching the them. Right. I was watching yeah. to see how many lefties there were. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. But I think the chief justice is he's not going to overrule the Republicans. I mean, I would like to think that he would make some independent judgments, that he would notice when they lie about that secret dungeon that it's just a secure room in the basement of the Capitol that both parties use. Or when the White House lawyers continue to claim that they were not invited to participate in right. the House process, which they right. were, and they just refused to. Right. That the Chief Justice would say, Tew! Exactly, exactly. But, no, he has not. Uh, intervened at all. Still a few days left, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but uh, he is concerned about how he looks and how the court looks. So he wants to look fair. And at least he did intervene that one evening, late in the evening, when uh, some of the comments on each side were getting personal. This is something that I know most of our journalist friends would disagree about, and maybe you too. It bothers me that the senator's are talking all the time. They walk out of the Senate and they give their opinion what they've heard so far. I mean, if you and I were on jury duty downtown Washington and we went out and talked to a reporter about what was happening in that case, oh no, we'd be thrown out of that bill, probably thrown in jail. No, right? you're you're told not to discuss Absolutely. with anyone. Absolutely, right. right. But, and the Democrats and Republicans are just free reign to talk to anybody right. they want to, not on the floor, obviously, but right. when they walk out. Well, there is a C-SPAN camera in there as well, so... I guess they feel like they're not violating any kind of public uh, oath. But it does, you know, the, the coverage um, does frame what's happening. I mean, it's kind right. of a yeah. uh, chicken yeah. and egg thing, what happens inside the hall and outside the hall. Because we hear every day, we haven't seen any sign of any Republican changing his or her mind, right? It's because they're out there gabbing, you know, all the time. We well, just like to see them yeah. shut up and listen to the testimony. I know. Well, Mitt Romney has, he's been pretty circumspect. I mean, he's probably the most likely one to actually vote to have uh, some witnesses called. Well, Um, on that point, um, you know, the famous statement that was made by somebody that Republicans know if they vote for witnesses, or certainly if they vote to acquit, their head's going to be on a pike. Right. Now, I believe somebody did say that. But some of these senators must be living in fear right. of showing any right. disagreement or any distance between themselves and the president. Yeah, right? But they don't. But they don't like to be held out for that because it makes them look cowardly. Uh, but in fact, I think it's pretty well known that the president has threatened to withhold uh, funds from. You know, he has control of a lot of campaign funds through various super Absolutely. PACs, et cetera, to withhold them from senators who uh, bolt. And then those who are still facing primary challenges, uh, the president basically suggests that they could they could face an instant challenger. So yeah, I've never seen a president who has this much sway over his party. And it's, it's a minority party, too. <laughs> Uh, but they are so, it, well, I'm not the first one to use the phrase cult. They really is cult-like. Which of the senators do you mention, Mitt Romney? Um, Susan, Susan Collins. Collins. Lisa Murkowski. Why not Lamar Alexander? 
Um, I wrote a column for the Daily Beast a couple of months ago about Lamar Alexander and what a disappointment he has been. <laughs> um, and I basically came to the conclusion that even though he's an institutionalist, he was former Secretary of Education in the George H.W. Bush ad administration, right. and he's kind of a courtly Southerner, that he's been a Republican all his life. He doesn't want to go back to Tennessee and have his party hate him. And Tennessee is a very red state now. So, but, yeah, he he's someone who you would think knows better and knows the kind of behavior this president exhibited in office should not be rewarded with an exoneration. But he may uh, end up like Jeff Flake or Bob Corker, right? Retiring and yet still not willing to... Right. Cross Donald right. Trump. Right, and it's not like they're even going to run for. They know they can't run for re, uh, for another election, so you know why not? But I guess nobody wants to be, you know, voted off the island. I guess is how right. I would put it. <laughs> <laughs> you said earlier, and I would agree that the chances are probably impossible, certainly very unlikely, that the president is going to be convicted. There may be a few Repub maybe a couple of Republicans at most would vote to convict him. Right. What impact, if any, do you think that will have in November? Let's assume he's acquitted. First question, what impact do you think that would have, if any, on the November 2020 election? Well, Charlie Cook, who's a, a very good political handicapper yep. here in Washington, says that uh, the president has a firm hold on his base, but there is that sliver of Americans that we call independents. And uh, to win, he would have to win two out of three of those, which is a pretty high mm -hmm. bar. But he was elected with 46.1% of the vote, I think. And he he doesn't have to win 50% because of the way of the Electoral College. So it's kind of stacked for him to win re-election. But um, those independents and what I would call some of the softer Republicans don't you think it will give them pause to give him another four years after he's been impeached and after more evidence is likely to come out uh, through the year? So I don't think it's a good thing. I mean, he will take a victory tour that he's been exonerated, well, but this is a stain on his leadership. Well, that was my second question, uh, which we can talk a little bit more about, is what, how Donald Trump will react to acquittal or non-conviction. You know, it's not the same, we know from O.J., that he's innocent. It's just was right. not convicted. Right. I mean, he will, it'll be no collusion, no corruption, <laughs> no nothing, right? Right, exactly. But um, Nancy Pelosi said he, he's been impeached and he'll be impeached forever. First line of his uh, obituary. And uh, he knows it's not a good thing. So, and I, I think the voters know it's not a good thing either. You and I um, have done a lot of TV things together. You were a frequent guest on Crossfire. We were mm -hmm. there with Pat Buchanan and Bob Novak. And uh, I, the tape was circulating last week online. Pat and I interviewing Mitch McConnell, Lindsey mm -hmm. Graham. They were all on there. Right. It's a different, it was a different Republican Party back. What happened to the Republican Party that you and I knew? in Washington. It doesn't um, exist anymore, does it? No. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan gave uh, the far right a seat at the table, but he didn't give them veto power. And I think uh, those elements in the Republican Party uh, grew, grew to dominate, and they really have become the party of exclusion um, their positions on, on immigration and on some racial issues are really, um, they're shameful. And um, I don't think they know how to get out of this spiral. They've just gone further and further to the right. And if you don't get far enough to the right, somebody has somebody else further on your right to go after you. And the Democrats have moved to the left, but not nearly to that extent. I see that Ezra Klein has a book out on uh, how did we get here. He's got a lot of uh, philosophical theories about how um, our um, various identities, if we have multiple identities and they cross party lines, there's much uh, there's less likelihood of any kind of civil war. But if we have identities and they stack up, 
and they put us firmly in one side of in a tribal corner, uh, it's very hard to overcome them, and it's very easy to tweak all those differences. And so you've got, you know, if you, you you can look at people now and say, if you know, if you live in a city, you don't go to church, um, you're a person of color. Okay, you're a Democrat. If you live in the mm -hmm. suburbs and you're white and you make a lot of money and you're a man and you like guns, <laughs> you're a Republican. <laughs> that we've gotten too good at sorting ourselves into the these various identity, categories. Identity politics. Yeah. And I've had some Republicans tell me, um, some who were invited to but didn't want anything to do with this Trump administration, um, but, but, but I guess you and I might call establishment Republicans, that they feel the party could recover if Trump is only there for four years, but if, if he's there for eight years, mm -hmm. that old Republican Party. The party of Ronald Reagan, in fact, yes, is gone. Yes, but remember Reagan started his 1980 campaign in Neshoba, Mississippi, yep. a highly unlikely place to start a national campaign. It was where the civil rights workers were yep. murdered. And he talked he about sent, states' rights. That's right. He sent messages. Uh, yep. Now, they, they, it's the party that used to send messages that they thought were kind of discreet, they're now shouting them over a bullhorn. <laughs> and so they've really cornered themselves and they've uh, made it impossible for a lot of other people to become Republicans, young uh, people in particular. I want to touch a couple of, uh, on a a couple of other issues before we, uh, where we wrap up here. One is, I don't know, what is it, maybe 15 years ago you wrote a book called Madam President. <laughs> yes. So here we are this year, and it looks like it didn't happen in 2016, mm -hmm. and now Elizabeth Warren and Amy Klobuchar are still final contenders in the Democratic primary, mm -hmm. but it doesn't look like this no. could be the year either. Did, how no. do you feel about that? The opening, be... the opening chapter of that book was Hillary Clinton deciding to run for the Senate in New York, a state she'd never lived in. And of course, she won, and she won big, and she got reelected, and she went on to run for president. And we, we don't want to rehash the 2016 campaign. Uh, I think, you know, Democrats are really concerned about beating Trump. And um, however... Many times you say, but Hillary won the popular vote in 2016. There's this lingering fear that you don't want to serve up a repeat of 2016, and maybe we ought to stick with a more familiar figure. So I think Elizabeth Warren is very impressive, and she got the endorsement of both the New York Times and the Des Moines, and the Des Moines. paper. Right. But um, everybody still worries about her electability. And the the senators who are up for re-election... Um, in those swing states, if you talk to the people who are trying to ch Democrats trying to challenge them, I don't think they're that eager to have Elizabeth Warren on the top of the ticket. That is, there's a fear that somebody that far left can't win in this country. Right. Bill Press talking with veteran journalist Eleanor Clift. If you'd like to hear the entire interview, visit BillPressPods.com. That's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Jesse Ulaberry, Richard J. Eskow, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.